Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to our webinar titled, Fishing for Insights from Single Lead and Multi-Lead ECG of Live Adult Zebrafish. This webinar has been sponsored by AD Instruments, so a big thank you to them for helping to make this event possible. Joining us today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Tao Nguyen, an Associate Professor of Medicine at UCLA. Her presentation will discuss the exciting discoveries that her research team has made, debunk some common myths about ECG and zebrafish, and share some be best practices for data acquisition, analysis, and interpretation. For over 30 years, AD Instruments has been creating simple, flexible tools to help scientists and educators record and analyze data quickly and efficiently. AD Instruments provides integrated solutions with the latest technology and powerful but simple tools that give you the ability to innovate and advance your research. Their gold standard solutions cover a variety of human, animal, in vitro, acute, and chronic applications, including zebrafish ECG. For more information about the tools that they offer, please see the resources tab for links to their website. I'm Sarah McFarland from the events team here at Inside Scientific, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. Now, before we get started, I'd like to just share a couple housekeeping notes to help you get the most out of today's webinar. First, this webinar is being recorded and resources will be made available following the event. Next, if the webinar panels look too big or too small, you can zoom in or out in your internet browser um, to adjust the viewing area. And you can also resize some of these panels and make the slide panel full screen. Please send questions, thoughts, and comments to us using the Ask a Question panel at any time during the webinar. And we'll also be running a number of audience polls um, and a survey at the end. So please chime in and share your perspectives with our team. And finally, if you do happen to experience any technical issues during the event, the easy fix tends to be a simple refresh of the browser, um, and that should reestablish your connection so you can hear us clearly and see the slides. If this doesn't work, um, you can use the Ask a Question panel to communicate your issue with our team, and we'll help to get you back up and running. And before we get started with our presentation today, we're just going to run a couple audience polls. So the first question is, do you currently do research involving zebrafish ECG? So there's yes, no, no, but I plan to in the future, and I don't do research. So I'll give everyone a couple seconds to answer that poll. And while we wait, just to give you a heads up, there are two more, two more polling questions that are gonna come through um, in the next couple minutes, so be ready to answer those. All right, we're just getting the last couple answers in here, which is great. We really appreciate your feedback on these polls, guys, so thank you for answering. All righty, and now we will move to our next poll question, which is what amount of research are you performing compared to pre-pandemic levels? So if you're back 100% and everything is that you used to do is still going on, then choose that 75 to 100%. Um, option. And if you don't do research, there's that bottom option for you. All right. Looks like a lot of you are back 100%. So that's fantastic. That's good to hear. Okay, a couple more seconds for that. And then we will move on to our next poll. All right, really appreciate those answers, guys. Okay, and our last question for this first polling section, which of the following models do you most often use? So zebrafish for people like Tao, <laughs> uh, mouse, rat, human, and other. Um, so excited to see this. Oh, a lot of zebrafish users so far, which is awesome. Great, okay, a couple more seconds there and then we'll get started with the good stuff. Okay, thanks everyone. And without further delay, I'm very pleased to welcome our presenter, Dr. Tao Wen. Tao, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sarah, for the kind introduction. And special thanks to Inside Scientific for the privilege to present and AD Instruments for the generous sponsorship. 
Hello everyone, this is Tao Nguyen, live from UCLA, David Geffen School of Medicine in Los Angeles. Today, I am sharing with you our published and unpublished data, as well as our behind the scenes trade secrets in the science and art of ECG recording and interpretation for adult zebra fish. Let's face it, in vivo ECG offers the single most practical, economical, if not unique solution to study in vivo cardiac electrophysiology. And zebrafish is celebrated as a practical, economical, and popular surrogate for human cardiac electrophysiology and arrhythmias. One reason for this popularity is that adult fish and human ECG are purportedly similar. As you see here on the left are human ECG traces from the three standard bipolar limb leads one to three, also called Antoven leads. On the right are fish ECGs recorded by different labs, including ours, using a single standard bipolar lead. But while human ECG, which was discovered 120 years ago by Antoven, remains a standard technique in routine clinical practice, Establishing similar standards for routine adult zebrafish cardiac research faces unique challenges. So today, we will review briefly the historical perspective of the ECG recording method. We will compare the anatomical perspectives unique to the adult human and zebrafish heart. We will describe the four basic steps in ECG recording, be it for single lead or dual lead. We will find ways to improve the recording quality we will interpret ECG, and lastly, we will demonstrate some clinical applications of zebrafish ECG in the diagnosis of arrhythmias, conduction blocks, and drug-induced cardiotoxicities. Let's start with the historical perspective. Regarded as the father of modern electrocardiography, Eindhoven was awarded the 1924 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discovery of the mechanism of the ECG. He coined the term ECG in 1893. He invented the first practical ECG recording device in 1903, and he designed the three standard bipolar limb leads in the frontal plane, one, two, and three, in constructing Eindhoven's triangle in 1912. The use of these three Eindhoven leads has since become universally entrenched in clinical ECG practice. These three leads placed on both arms and the left leg represent the three sides of an imaginary inverted equilateral triangle enclosing the human heart. In this closed circuit, the leads are related according to Eindhoven's law, which states that voltage in lead 2 is the sum of voltages in leads 1 and 3. Note that of the three Eindhoven leads, lead 1 reflects frontal electrical activity along the heart short axis between the left and right side of the heart base, but leads two and three reflect frontal electrical activity along the heart long axis between the ventricular base and apex. Then along came Wilson in 1934, who introduced three unipolar limb leads, VR, VL, and VF, with R, L, and F sh short for right, left, and foot. His goal was to diminish the influence of the reference electrode. In 1942, Goldberger removed the resistor between the limb and central terminal to augment the lead, lead voltages by 1.5 times, and the leads became known as the three unipolar augmented leads, AVR, AVL, and AVF, with the letter A short for augmented. And that is how we have six limb leads in total, three bipolar and three unipolar. By convention, we display all six frontal limb leads here on a hexaxial reference system called the Cabrera system. To ease reference, we number the four quadrants of the Cabrera circle from one to four in clockwise direction, starting with quadrant one from zero to 90 degrees, quadrant two from 90 degrees to 180 degrees, and so on. Using Eindhoven triangle, the three frontal electrical heart axis for the P-wave, QRS complex, and T-wave can be defined. Because in humans, the QRS complex is the largest component out of the three ECG waveforms. The QRS axis, identified by Eindhoven's triangle, defines the main heart axis. In normal human adults, the main heart axis is in quadrant one. 
whereas abnormal shifts of the main axis to the other three quadrants are found in cardiomyopathies. Let's switch gear and take a moment to appreciate the anatomical disadvantages and advantages of the adult zebrafish heart as a model for human cardiac electrophysiology. Zebrafish is cold-blooded, while humans are not. The adult human and zebrafish hearts not only differ in size by two orders of magnitude, they also differ in layout, with humans having two atria, two ventricles, while zebrafish having only one atrium and one ventricle. Additionally, during development, the human embryonic heart undergoes chamber maturation and the spongy, trabeculated ventricular myocardium becomes progressively more compact. As shown here on the left, in this human heart, the compacted layer denoted by the yellow arrow is much thicker than the trabeculated layer denoted by the black arrow. A widely recognized disorder of human heart maturation is left ventricular non-compaction, as shown in the middle figure. In this non-compacted human heart, the left ventricular wall is deeply trabeculated throughout, and the compacted layer is thinner than the non-compacted layer. Now, in comparison, in the normal adult zebrafish heart, as shown on the right, progressive compaction of the trabeculated ventricular myocardium never occurs. So the mature zebrafish heart has only a thin, compact epicardial layer, but a thick, non-compacted, spongy, trabeculated layer. Now, with all these setbacks from drastic anatomical differences, can zebrafish really be a useful, suitable model for human cardiac electrophysiology? Well, the good news is that the fundamental electrical properties of the adult zebrafish and human hearts are remarkably similar. For example, Setmira and colleagues found that during spontaneous sinus rhythm, spacemaker activity starts in the sinoatrial node, or SA node, located at the sinus venosus. Then, the cardiac action potential propagates through the atrium to the atrioventricular ring, or AV ring, which is the functional equivalent of the human AV node. Then the action potential proceeds from the AV node preferentially and rapidly down two main trabecular bands in the ventricle to the ventricular apex. Now, these two main trabecular bands are the functional equivalents of the Hispurkinji system in humans. Because Setmera and colleagues gladly showed that ablation of these two trabecular bands result in complete heart block. The similarity in action potential propagation in zebrafish and human hearts mirrors the similarity of ECG morphology, which brings us to the next section on ECG recording. Comparing to human lead 2, fish ECG does look strikingly similar. Like humans, zebrafish shows a distinct P wave, QRS complex, and T wave. But these two traces were recorded from opposite leads. The human trace was recorded from lead 2, while the fish trace was recorded from lead reverse 2 or R2. Human lead 2 axis is defined <coughs> by, a <coughs> by a negative electrode in the right arm and positive electrode in the left leg, orienting 60 degrees on the Cabrera system. In contrast to the routine practice of ECG recording from 12 leads in humans, fish ECG is conventionally recorded from only one lead because of the physical limitation in fish chest size. The standard FISH ECG lead orients in reverse orientation to human lead 2 at roughly negative 120 degrees. So we name this FISH standard lead reverse 2 or R2. So you can see that lead placement is an absolutely critical point to keep in mind as we learn the four basic steps of ECG recording. These four steps include in chronological order, first, setting up FISH and equipment, Second, anesthesia induction. Third, ECG lead placement. And lastly, ECG recording. In the interest of time, we won't discuss survival protocol in which we need to allow fish to recover from anesthesia, nor we will we discuss ECG recording for longer than 20 minutes, for which we need to provide fish with anesthesia maintenance in addition to ample hydration and oxygenation. 
Please don't worry about the details of these four steps, which we have laid out in our job publication. The, ar the article is open access, courtesy of AD Instruments. The only caveat is that the publication is on single lead recording. So for dual lead recording, we will clarify the necessary minor adjustments. Our lab uses zebrafish from the UCLA core facility. The fish there are maintained in flow-through aquarium systems on a 14-hour light, 10-hour dark cycle at 28 degrees C. They are fed with flake food daily and live brine shrimp twice daily. On the day of the experiment, we bring the fish from the aquarium to the lab. We also obtain all the necessary accessories, importantly, a wet sponge with slit to hold the fish during ECG recording. Our lab uses the ADI system to record ECG. We found this high-performance system reliable, the noise reasonably filtered, and the tiny voltage signals of fish hearts acceptably, if not beautifully, optimized. Moreover, for us, it's economical because we use the same system for our rodent and rabbit models. Whatever your cup of tea, an ECG recording system requires three basic components. First, a data acquisition hardware such as power lab. Second, a single amplifier for single lead ECG recording or a dual amplifier for dual lead ECG recording. And lastly, data acquisition and analysis and analysis software such as lab chart. For more details, you can go to the AD instrument website as listed here to browse through explanations and demonstrations. Step two concerns anesthesia induction. The goal is to achieve level four of anesthesia for pain control and fish immobilization. Most labs, including ours, use Tricane or MS-222. For wild type AB zebra fish aged 12 to 18 months, immersion in a 0.02 to 0.04% Tricane solution induces level four of anesthesia within three minutes. Despite well-known risk of heart-lung toxicities, Tricane is still the most widely used and the only anesthetic approved by the US FDA for zebrafish anesthesia. So the key here is to choose the appropriate anesthetics for your experiments and to determine the minimal concentration needed, the depth and duration of anesthesia by balancing the anesthetic toxicities against the need to absolutely suppress motion artifacts. A typical strategy to lower toxicities is to capitalize on the synergistic potency of a combination of anesthetics and paralytics to lower the dose of individual agents. And if needed, you can consult the veterinarian at your institution for more guidance. Now we are getting to the fun part, ECG recording. Let's tackle single lead first. Once zebrafish maintains level four of anesthesia for three seconds, we use a pair of blunt forceps to transfer it to onto the damp sponge with a slit, then to surface up. For single lead placement, we insert three electrodes about one millimeter deep. We can record from any lead we wish, but the standard zebrafish single lead is reversed too. This lead configuration is obtained by positioning the red positive electrode in the ventral midline at the level of the bulbous arteriosus, one to two millimeter above an imaginary horizontal line connecting the two lower edges of the opic operculums as shown here in blue. Then use this positive electrode as reference to position the black negative electrode caudally and one millimeter left laterally at a distance greater than the maximum length of the ventricle. Finally, position the green reference electrode caudally near the anal region. Now, if all you need is a single lead ECG, you are all set to record. But in ECG recording, the more leads, the better, so as not to miss any abnormalities. Plus, it's not possible to define heart access based on a single lead. This is important because the gap of knowledge in the field is that the zebrafish electrical heart axis and their underlying mechanisms are unknown. So our aim here is to construct the first zebrafish intervention triangle. And this is what we've recently accomplished by recording concurrently from leads one and two. Wait a minute, you ask. How is it possible to construct Eintervent's triangle by concurrent recording from just two Eintervent leads instead of all three? Well, for two reasons. 
First, a hard axis can be defined by the vector sum of electric coactivity projections on just any two Einthoven leads, because the three leads are all related by Einthoven's law. Although ideally, one lead should be in the hard short axis and the other lead in the hard long axis. And second, and you're gonna love this, when we record concurrently from any two Einthoven leads, say leads 1 and 2, LabChart software has an algorithm that uses lead 1 and 2 data to derive concurrent information for the remaining four limb leads. Yes, you hear it right. So how wonderful is that to have six limb lead data by recording concurrently from just two leads? Placement for lead 2 is done the same way as for lead R2, but with flipped polarity to insert the positive electrode at the apex and the negative electrode at the base. Placement for lead 1 is done by inserting lead 1 negative electrode at the ventricular base next to lead 2 negative electrode, then by inserting lead 1 positive electrode also at the base 2 mm left laterally to lead 1 negative electrode. And now we are ready for the easiest and most satisfying step, recording ECG. I draw here two pink rectangles to remind you an important step in record keeping, and that is to identify and label your leads. This step is very important for later interpretation. Because the ECG is not very meaningful if the lead identity is unknown. As shown in this example, we label the dual channels as lead 1 and lead 2 and the derived channels were also clearly listed. But we are not home free yet. We are now ready for the most challenging yet most rewarding step, ECG interpretation. But first, let's discuss how to improve recording quality. The recording quality depends on signal to noise ratio. That means the higher the signal to noise ratio, the prettier the ECG trace. This means that we need to reduce noise and increase voltage signal amplitudes. There are at least three factors we can control to reduce noise, going from large to small physical scales. First, when setting up the ECG station, avoid setting it up close to any powerful generator sources of electrical noise and hum, such as large fridges and freezers. Second, in setting up recording, use noise filtering. For the adult zebrafish, we find the following setting to yield consistent and satisfactory signal-to-noise ratio. Range of 2 mV, low pass at 120 Hz, high pass at 0.03 second at a sampling rate of 1 kHz. Lastly, in preparing zebrafish test subject, as we have just discussed, anesthesia is key to suppress motion artifacts. Those are the three ways that we can use to reduce noise. But what can we do to increase signal amplitudes? Due to biological variations in how the heart hangs inside the fish chest, which in turn affect orientation of the heart axis, lead repositioning may be needed to align the leads with the heart axis to maximize voltage amplitudes, particularly of the T wave, which is notoriously the smallest of the three fish ECG waveforms. And the best chance to optimize lead positioning is during live ECG interpretation of initial ECG traces. In ECG signal optimization, three sets of electrical propagation principles are helpful and best illustrated here by Dr. Kulbundi. First, maximal ECG voltage is achieved when electrical activity travels in parallel with the lead axis. Conversely, flat line on ECG means that electrical activity travels in perpendicular in perpendicular to a lead axis. Second, the positive ECG deflection means that either depolarization travels toward the positive electrode or repolarization travels away from the positive electrode. Lastly, a negative ECG deflection means either depolarization traveling away from the positive electrode or repolarization traveling towards the positive electrode. Post recording. There are so many delightful insights to learn from a single lead ECG and even more so from a dual lead ECG. From the ECG analysis menu, select ECG settings to open a dialog box to predefine various parameter settings for software automatic analysis. Since there is no zebrafish preset, 
we choose the best available and closest to zebrafish, which is the human preset. Talking about clinical relevance, it's unbelievable, right? Now, for heart rhythm, we determine the heart rhythm is to be sinus if there is a P wave preceding every QRS by a normal and reasonably short PR interval. We determine rhythm regularity by the regularities of successive PP and RR intervals. Zebrafish P wave can be quite large, even larger than the R wave, at times as shown is this figure. So it's important to verify that the software identifies P wave and R wave correctly, and we can fix any auto-identification errors by moving the misplaced cursors to the appropriate waves. But how to fish for insights from heart rate? The software allows us to study heart rate variability readily and to generate plots such as Poincaré plot as shown here in this example from our publication. This Poincaré plot compares a fish heart rate variability before oxidative stress in black and after oxidative stress administration in red to show how H2O2 brought chaos to the dynamics of beat-to-beat -beat heart rate variability. Measurements of amplitudes and durations are also straightforward and automated once all the waveforms are correctly identified. The software can correct the QT interval to heart rate using the method of our choice. So, how to fish for insights from amplitudes? The beauty here is that the amplitudes are polarized. Therefore, the wave polarity reveals to us the direction of wave propagation. Here's an example from our publication showing that by comparing the QRS amplitude and T-wave amplitudes before and after oxidative stress, absence or presence of KN93, which is an inhibitor of calcium carmodulin dependent protein kinase 2 or chem kinase 2 activity, we found that H2O2 reversed QRS and T-wave polarities from positive to negative through a chem kinase 2 dependent mechanism. These ECG findings help us to predict that H2O2 reverts both the ventricular activation and reposition gradients, which we later confirmed by optical mapping using voltage dye. Likewise, here ECG shows that H2O2 prolongs the duration of three waveforms, the QRS complex, the QT interval, and SD segment. These ECG findings lead to three prediction of important insights. QRS prolongation by H2O2 on ECG leads to the prediction that H2O2 impairs ventricular activation, which we later confirmed by activation optical maps. QT prolongation by H2O2 on ECG leads to the prediction that H2O2 impairs ventricular reposition, which we later confirmed by reposition time optical maps. ST prolongation by H2O2 on ECG leads to the prediction that H2O2 prolongs the action potential duration, or APD, which we later confirmed by APD optical maps and voltage tracings. Importantly, thanks to the ECG insight that H2O2 prolongs ST, we can predict that the tissue and cellular mechanisms responsible for ventricular reposition is prolongation of the action potential plateau. What additional types of insights can we fish from dual lead ECG? Let's find out by dual leads ECG recording, say from lead one and lead two, to construct the first fish intervens triangle. Then we can compare fish and human intervens triangle. One key similarity between the two intervens triangles here is that within each species, all three ECG components in each lead have the same polarity. We call this polarity concordance. Fish P wave and QRS polarities within the same lead align. This indicates that fish atrial and, vent and ventricular activation proceed in the same direction as seen in humans. Fish QRS and T wave polarities within the same lead also align. This indicates that fish ventricular activation and reposition proceed in opposite directions as seen in humans. Another key similarity between fish and humans is a positive concordance in lead 1. This finding establishes the clinical relevance of this uncommon fish lead because it proves that along the heart short axis, fish atrial and ventricular activation and ventricular reposition are similar to those three electrical activities in humans. 
In contrast, one key difference between the two triangles is the opposite polarity concordance of the three ECG components in leads 2 and 3. The concordance in leads 2 and 3 is predominantly negative for fish, but positive for humans. So what's the implication of this finding? The implication is that the three zebrafish frontal axis should be somewhere between 0 and negative 120 degrees. Using Eindhoven's triangle, we can precisely define the three frontal electrical heart axes by painstakingly calculating the vector sum of the two vector projections in leads 1 and 2 manually. Or we can do this rapidly and automatically with lab chart software. Now, just as in humans, FishQRS is also the largest of the three ECG waveforms, therefore FishQRS axis also determines fish main heart axis. In this case, we are calculating the QRS axis or main heart axis for this fish using lab chart, which determines the main axis for this fish to be in quadrant 4 at negative 53 degrees, which is consistent with our manual calculation of the vector sum of the two QRS projections in leads 1 and 2. We can repeat the same process to determine the P and the T axis for this fish and other fish. So, from 24 normal adult human EKGs, we construct 24 Eindhoven triangles and confirm that all three human heart axes aligned as expected in quadrant 1, consistent with extensive literature. Here, the colorful wedges represent the 95% confidence interval for each axis, and the black lines within them represent the means, also listed in white numbers. From 30 healthy adult fish, we construct 30 fish Eindhoven triangles and found that all three fish heart axes align in quadrant 4, not quadrant 1. With both the mean P wave and QRS axis at roughly negative 70 degrees and the mean T wave axis at negative 50 degrees. So we conclude that fish heart axes do not align with those of humans, but are instead reflections across zero degrees in the Cabrera system. Ah, onward to the home stretch now. We will demonstrate the clinical relevance of fish Eindhoven's triangle in diagnosing arrhythmias, conduction blocks, and in, in vivo drug screening for cardiotoxicities. The adult zebrafish heart can be induced to recapitulate all sorts of human arrhythmias, such as sinus bradyarrhythmia, sinus tachybradyarrhythmia, or even sinus arrest, rescued by ventricular escape rhythm, which in these examples were all induced by oxidative stress. Impressively, thanks to the presence of zebrafish AV node and its two main trabecular bands, the adult zebrafish can also be induced to recapitulate all four types of human AV conduction blocks, such as first-degree AV block, diagnosed by prolongation of the PR interval, second-degree AV block type 1 or MOBITS1, by fixed by prolongation of a PR interval before the QIS drops out, second degree AV block type 2 or MOBIT2, diagnosed by prolongation of the PR interval until the QRS drops out, or third degree AV block or complete heart block. Next, we will demonstrate an application of zebrafish Eindhoven's triangle in in vivo drug screening using digitalis at low dose to recapitulate human digitalis effect which is defined as the earliest non-toxic ECG manifestation of adequate cardiac tissue absorption. Then we will use digitalis at high dose to recapitulate human digitalis cardiotoxicities. Digitalis, or in short ditch, was isolated from the Fox Glove plant back in 1930. And by 2017 in the US alone, it gave rise to more than 3 million prescriptions per year, although it has since fallen out of favor due to high morbidity. As a cardiac glycoside, Ditch exerts direct myocardial action by blocking the sodium-potassium pump, thereby raising extracellular potassium and intracellular sodium. Excess intracellular sodium activates the reverse mode of the sodium-calcium exchanger to raise intracellular calcium. Elevated intracellular calcium induces increased contractility or positive inotropy, accounting for ditch therapeutic benefit for heart failure. Additionally, ditch also exerts a robust indirect action on the heart autonomic nervous system to increase vagal tone, accounting for its benefit for atrial fibrillation. In humans, the digitalis effect manifests in hallmark ECG changes, three of which we will highlight today. 
The first human ditch effect is sagging SD depression. The SD segment is described as lured, sagging, or scooped, and resembles either a hockey stick or, my favorite, Salvador Dali's mustache. Indeed, fish lead one recapitulate this human ditch effect, but lead two registers this effect in mirror image as convex SD elevation instead of concave SD depression. The second human ditch effect is T-wave inversion. Again, fish lead one faithfully recapitulates this hallmark human ditch effect showing T-wave inversion from positive to negative, but lead two registers T-wave inversion in mirror image from negative to positive instead. The third human ditch effect is PR prolongation, causing first degree heart block, which is most consistently recapitulated by both leads. The finding of differences between leads 1 and 2 in reflecting certain ditch effects underscores the benefit of assessing drug effects from two leads, thus capturing both a hard, long and short axis instead of a from single lead as in current practice. Human ditch cardiotoxicities can be divided into three categories. First, ditch suppressant toxicities on AV conduction are due to increased vagal tone, causing second degree AV block, morbids 1 and 2, as well as complete heart block. Second, ditch excitatory toxicities are due to increased intracellular calcium, causing increased automaticity, resulting in atrial and ventricular tachycardia, ectopic activity, and atrial fibrillation. Lastly, a hallmark third ditch toxicity is hyperkalemia due to inhibition of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. In sum, today we have reviewed the historical perspective of ECG recording, we compared the anatomical perspectives unique to the adult human and zebrafish heart, we described the four basic steps in ECG recording for single lead and dual lead, we discussed the four ways to improve recording quality by controlling noise and increasing signal amplitudes. Then we interpreted ECG. Lastly, we demonstrated some clinical applications of zebrafish ECG in the diagnosis of arrhythmias and conduction blocks. Importantly, we shared with you unpublished dual lead ECG data of the first zebrafish interventions triangle. Using dual lead ECG, we defined the three frontal heart electrical axes of zebrafish in quadrant four, which are reflections of the three human heart axes in quadrant one. We also showed how zebrafish interventions triangle remarkably recapitulates hallmark human digitalist effect faithfully along the heart short axis, but in mirror image along the heart long axis. Lastly, I'd like to thank NIH for critical funding support and people in my lab for their dedication and hard work, particularly Dr. Yali Zhao, Dr. Bin Nguyen, and Dr. Nick James. Thank you all, all right. and the floor back to you, Sarah. Thanks so much, Tao, that was fantastic. So much great information, and we are going to get to your questions in just about a minute. But before we do, we are going to run some audience polls. So there's two questions here. The first question is, were you aware of 80 instruments and their solutions before this webinar? Yes or no? And as we wait for those to roll in, uh, we have some really positive comments here um, from some of our attendees and they're, they're saying thank you um, to you, Tao, for your great presentation. So um, that's really nice to see. And I am going to move to the next question now, which is, would you like AD Instruments to contact you with additional resources on zebrafish ECG research? Uh, and that's a yes or no question as well. Um, so this just helps uh, the ADI team uh, to follow up with the people who have joined us today. So we really appreciate your feedback on that question. All right, we've got quite a few questions rolling in here. Um, for everyone that missed the beginning um, Housekeeping notes, there is an ask a question panel. Please type your questions uh, into that panel um, and we will address them with Tao. And if we don't get to them, we will send a Q&A report after the webinar. All right, so let's get going on these questions. Tao, are you back with us? Uh, yes, I'm Great. here. Great, okay. So our first question is, why does the fish have a different heart axis from humans? Oh, 
That is such a good and sophisticated question. The short answer is we don't know. The long answer is we can predict it. Uh, at least we can make some educated guess as to why. So to make predicted guess, let's look at the human heart model first. So we know that there are reposition gradients, uh, activation uh, gradients in the human heart, right? So what sets up these gradients in the human heart? And people have found out that the gradient of, uh, let's say, uh, reposition was set up by different uh, expression of uh, ion channels in the base, in the ventricular base versus the apex. Yeah, so those the gradient of reposition of ventricular reposition set up at least in humans by two currents, and that is IKS and ITO. The transient outward current, also called ITO, and IKS, which is a um, uh, slowly activating delayed rectifier potassium current. The problem is these two currents are missing in the zebrafish heart. Yeah, the zebrafish does not express ITO at all. It doesn't even have the gene for it. And that's why if you look at the uh, zebrafish ventricular action potential, you do not see that notch. Yeah, there is no phase one. There are only four phases in the ventricular action potential of zebrafish heart. Whereas in humans, there are five phases, zero to four. So the fish, ze uh, ze the zebra fish action potential misses phase one, which is the notch. And that is due to the lack of uh, expression of transient outward current. The fish doesn't have a uh, uh, significant expression of IKS either, even though it does have the gene. So if we have to predict, that is because of the differential expression of some ionic currents in the base, in the ventricular base, compared to the ventricular apex that sets up these gradients. Now, what is the molecular identity? Which current is that? We are currently working on it, but we do not have the specific answer yet. Yeah. Um, okay. But if you think about uh, cardiac action potential, there are basically three types of currents that are important. The sodium currents, the potassium currents, and the calcium current. So one of those, we are suspecting some potassium uh, currents are you know, responsible for setting up the difference in that uh, uh, different axis, at least in ventricular reposition. But okay. great question. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, we've got another question here. Um, this is a technical question for you. Um, this person has said, any tips on proper electrode positioning? Um, how can we ensure that they're placed correctly? Oh, very good. And I um, went over that briefly in my uh, notes. And how to ensure, how do we know that that is the most optimal? Well, by trial and error, by practicing it. And the best time to fix things is live interpretation. Once you are set and ready to record, as soon as you record, you analyze it, you interpret it live, and you look at the ECG tracing and you see, is it good? Is it good? Uh, voltage signals? If it is not, if you think that it is too, too small uh, amplitude, then you readjust the positioning right away. You see, because the trick is in ECG, in in vivo ECG recording, you can't really see the heart to know how to position it best, right? You have a rough idea of how it is. Another uh, thing that make it challenging, not only because you can't see the heart uh, through the tissue in the uh, adult fish, but the heart of the fish differently from the heart of human, it hangs in a sac, which has more uh, uh, epicardial fluid uh, around it, surrounding it. So it can, uh, flop around a little bit. So the, the axis might be a little bit more difficult and, and less stable than the uh, the axis in the human heart, say. Okay, so you just need to play around with it. If you have a single lead ECG, if you're doing single lead ECG, I would just play around with one lead you know, moving one lead, uh, one electro, uh, one one electrode, not not both electrodes at the same time. You keep one 
electrode fixed, let's say you keep the negative electrode fixed and you move the positive electrode and, and so on um, until you get, um, until you, you can increase the voltage signals a little bit more. Yeah. But I'd say just practice, 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 practice makes perfect and then you'll get the hang of it. Okay, that's great. And we've got another question here. Um, have you ever tried to record ECG on zebrafish larvae? <laughs> nope. Let's not push the limits. <laughs> but uh, no, we work with uh, adult zebrafish only. Yeah. There are people who do that, though. There are um, uh, scientists who actually record uh, you know, electrical activity from uh, larvae um, uh, was published. Okay, and someone else has asked, why is the P wave so big and does the size of the P wave change with the depth of anesthesia? Oh, wow, that's a really good question. In the uh, in comparing and contrasting the anatomical differences of the uh, adult human heart and adult fish heart, I didn't point out um, that the uh, in relative uh, proportions, the age, uh, the, the zebra fish atrium is very large. It's almost as large, if not sometimes larger than the, uh, the ventricle of the zebra fish ventricle. And you know that the voltage signals on EKG is relative to the mass, to the myocardial mass. So if the fish has a large uh, atrium, it would reflect in having large um, uh, P wave. Uh, but uh, the relative proportion between the P wave and QRS, you know, it, it's, it's like that for that particular fish. So it's not all, QRS is still the biggest, but you would see that uh, a lot of times you will see uh, as, as compared to, to humans, uh, uh, say, the P wave is the smallest of the three ECG components, yes? Because relatively speaking, in uh, normal, healthy adult, human adults, the atria are much smaller as compared to the ventricles. Hmm. That's why when uh, in, in abnormal cardiomyopathies, in which, uh, let's say, abnormal atrioma, uh, atriomyopathies in humans, when the atria are really enlarged, what did you see? You see enlarged of the P waves on EKG. Either the right atrium is enlargement or left atrial enlargement. So that is really, really great question. Zebrafish P wave is the second largest component. The T wave of zebrafish is unfortunately tiny and sometimes it is so small it's hard to actually uh, diagnose or, or recognize on ECG. Not a problem with humans, right? T wave is the second largest component of the three ECG components for human ECG. Yeah. So that is a key anatomical difference. It can be to our benefit if we want to study, uh, let's say, atrial uh, arrhythmias in zebrafish. Okay, fantastic. All right, um, we've got another kind of technical question here. Um, this question is, when fish are anesthetized with uh, tricane um, and not ventilated, the heart rate is severely affected. Um, do you ventilate your fish and how? Oh, very good question. A short answer is um, the um, the webinar is focused on, uh, as I said, um, disclaimer earlier on that short ECG se uh, session, you know, not more than 20 minutes. With not you, with short ECG session, we, we think we can get by with uh, not having to do anything much extra. But as I said, if um, if um, if you need to record for longer than 15 or 20 minutes, we would really suggest looking up the literature to show and uh, to, to know how to provide fish with ample oxygenation, uh, uh, you know, hydration, and you also need to provide a little bit more of uh, uh, tricane maintenance. Yeah, what we go over today is induction. We didn't even go into um, maintenance. We don't need maintenance for short session. They're pretty quiet. 
But yeah, you point out a really, really good point. I mean, that's the kind of like the bullet you have to bite and you have to, uh, you know, uh, balancing. Uh, you have to do the balancing between taking the uh, toxicity, which means uh, the depression of a uh, cardio respiratory functions versus controlling for motion artifact. Otherwise, ECG is not interpretable. Absolutely. Okay, before we move on to some more questions, and thank you everyone again for these questions. They're really fantastic. I did want to bring your attention to the survey. So if you do have to dip out a little bit early, that's okay. Um, we do have a survey here that we'd love to get your feedback on the webinar. And now we will continue with more questions with Tao. So um, our next question here is, um, well, this person has said excellent presentation to start. Um, and then have you tried drugs that increase QT interval and were you able to record TDP? Awesome question. Uh, yes, um, there are drugs that increase uh, QT, uh, absolutely. And actually we, uh, we did present that, we did publish that. H202 that uh, we presented today uh, is uh, an agent that can actually uh, prolong QT. Now, um, Digitalis, I didn't go over this, but uh, we we mentioned that um, the fish recapitulate three hallmark, three hallmark uh, human ditch effect, right? The fourth hallmark ditch effect, I didn't go over. In humans, uh, the fourth hallmark ditch effect is QT shortening. We did not see QT shortening by digitalis. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we see QT prolongation, not shortening. Um, we're still working on it. As to why, and again, just like with the uh, with the heart axis, the difference has to be in some of the potassium currents that are different between the fish and the and the human heart. Yeah, but thank you for for for. Uh, attending the webinar today and for asking questions. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. We've got another question here. Um, this is, do you monitor heart rate? And if so, uh, approximately, what is the range that you like to keep your zebrafish heart rate in for um, proper ECG studies? Uh, the temperature, uh, if I understand correctly, um, uh, the, the, we do it at room temperature. So is is that the the question? Um, you they're asking the question? if you monitor if you monitor heart rate, um, and if so, at what heart rate range do you consider a good range for the ECG measures? Oh, okay. Um, heart rate. Uh, okay. Yeah, the heart rate is, is, is right away. The heart rate. If if the fish is in sinus. The heart rate is also the ventricular rate. It's also the atrial rate if it's in sinus. Uh, if the fish is not in sinus, then usually the heart rate is the uh, the ventricular rate or the RR interval, and it shows you right away. And uh, typically, even under anesthesia, uh, the fish heart rate is about like, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, about uh, in the range of hundred beats per minute. Uh, if it is really deep in anesthesia, it can be slower than that. But uh, roughly for that age group of uh, adult fish, like say 12 to 18 months of age, yeah. But you could see okay. it right away. I mean, it it, uh, it shows you on the software analysis, you see it live. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got another question here. This question is, um, I'm assuming the compounds are being added to the water, but how are you controlling for absorption post dosage administration? And are you running TK slash PK pharmacokinetics um, to ensure consistency among subjects within their respective dose groups? Good question. We do all those, uh, we did all those prelim studies in the beginning, but we didn't repeat it. And um, the reason is uh, because we use the same uh, strain, like AB wild type, you know, that is one. And um, so we we found that uh, despite 
you know, obviously there's always biological variations, right? It's the same for, for humans. Uh, a, uh, the absorption, the uh, uh, different things uh, can affect it how we uh, how each person or how each fish metabolize the drugs and uh, you just go by you know the general population that you determine so we found as I uh, disclosed that a four hour strain of uh, fish AB wild type and for that age group uh, between 12 to 18 months of age uh, we found that 0.02 to 0.04 percent is uh, solution works best yeah, and that is dissol dissolving in a tricane solution and let fish swim in it. How do we know that it is good enough? And that's how you have to observe to see when the fish reach level four of anesthesia. So once it reached level four anesthesia and stays in it for like about three seconds, get them out of the tricane solution quickly to the to the uh, to the sponge ready for recording. Don't leave them there for long because they're gonna die. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, someone else has asked, um, and I think you just mentioned it with a sponge, but maybe you can kind of go a little bit further into this. Um, how do you keep the fish out of water um, during the procedure? Oh, um, once you are ready, you need to move the fish from the trichene solution once a fish already reaches level four of anesthesia, you move it into a sponge. You can just take any sponge and create a, a, a deep slit in it. And then you put the fish inside the slit. You could um, go to our Jove uh, article also to see more of those uh, pictures uh, or, or any uh, you know, in the literature. Everybody was pretty much using the same. So the sponge, there's a slit, and then you place the fish with ventral surface up inside the slit. That's how you keep it also, you know, straight and uh, ready for recording. Um. Okay, great. And just um, to reiterate this again, what uh, is the suitable dose that you use for tricane for anesthetizing these fish for the short term procedure? Um, yeah, it's 0.02 to 0.04% tricane solution. But what what I would advise is this. You have a certain strain of zebrafish that you know you will be working with. You have an age range of zebrafish, uh, a, 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 you know, a certain uh, range of weights of zebrafish that you'll be working with. Test for yourself. It, unless you use the exact same strain that we are using, like A, B, wild type, 12 to 18 months, you, you don't know, right? even we don't know for sure. So we tested from 0.02 to 0.04%. Sometimes 0.02 is good enough and sometimes need to give a little bit more 0.03%. So even with that, you know, it's it's the distribution, right? It's the distribution of, uh, of your fish. So if you haven't done already, then when you just start out, um, just try out on your uh, population of fish to see what is their distribution of uh, trichane absorption to reach level four of anesthesia, okay? And if you need even more concrete help, a good resource is always go to, you know, your institutional uh, IACUC, go get the a vet to help you out with that. They have plenty of uh, really excellent advice for it to work with the specific strain that you need. And right. uh, guys, if I do not, if I fail to ask, uh, to answer, uh, address your your question the way that uh, that you 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 want me to, please uh, please ask again if I somehow did not get to the point of your question. Please let me know. Mm -hmm. It's actually funny that you say that. We do have a follow up question from one of the questions earlier, and I think just um, to be respectful of everyone's time, this is going to be the last one that we answer. Um, so the question is, um, did you observe any um, arrhythmia such as polymorphic ventricular tachycardia related to QT prolongation? Oh, great question. I love it. You know, um, we have an MI model 
the MI model, uh, myocardial infarction model uh, by cryoablation. I mean, this model has been, you know, established for zebrafish. And um, when we um, over cryo uh, cryoablated a little bit, when the student um, uh, do a little bit too much of ablation, there is some fish that actually uh, suffers a, a sudden cardiac death on follow-up at uh, day one or day two, uh, they uh, went into, uh, like the QT was definitely prolonged, that's for sure, uh, you know, uh, but QT prolongation put them at risk for developing sudden cardiac arrest by developing VT. So we have seen like um, uh, bidirectional VT uh, from, uh, let's say, ditch. We have seen VT um, monomorphic from, um, monomorphic VT from uh, cryoablation uh, leading to uh, uh, sudden cardiac death. But polymorphic VT, uh, it might be a little bit rare for us to see. Yeah, with really very high dose of ditch, uh, ditch di di toxin, uh, we could see it, but it's rare. Probably because we won't push to such high dose, so it's rare, but definitely, yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, I just wanted to thank you again, Tao, for your fantastic insights today, both in your presentation as well as the Q&A session. So thank you again for being here with us. You're most welcome. It's my delight and honor. Great. Okay. And I also wanted to thank everyone who attended the webinar today. Um, a sli uh, the slides and a recording of today's webinar will be made available pretty soon, hopefully by the end of the day today. So look out for an email giving you access to that recording in the near future. And before you go, again, we do invite you to uh, take a moment to provide your feedback on that survey and let us know what webinar topics you'd like to see in the future. And finally, if you still have any questions, please feel free to submit them using the Ask a Question panel. Uh, we'll make sure to forward them along to Tao, and she will answer those in a full Q&A report, which, uh, when it's ready, will be sent to all registrants. So also keep your eyes peeled for that. And in closing, thank you again for taking a part in this Inside Scientific webinar, and we really look forward to having you with us again soon.